Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It is an act of justice, the protection of a fundamental right, the right to dignity and a decent life. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Today in Sri Lanka, we are living in a country where seven million people are living below the poverty line. Let that sink in. Seven million of our own brothers and sisters are living below the poverty line. That is the state that Sri Lanka is in today. We're talking about debt optimization. The government is focused on that. But has enough attention been paid on the plight of our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka who are suffering as a result of the mistakes that we made collectively as a country. To discuss on these matters and more, we've got with us, of course, as usual, an expert panel here at Face the Nation. First, we've got uh, Tania Abe Sundara. She is the president of the Sri Lanka Business United Forum. Thank you very much, Tania, for joining us on our show. Uh, this is, of course, not your first time on the show. Thank you very much. Uh, up next, we've got Brahm Nicholas, economist. Thank you very much, Brown, for taking time and joining us on our show today. Uh, we've also got the chairperson of the Sri Lanka Banks Association, Bigumal Thevarathantri. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us on our program. Thanks for having me. And we've also got the chairman of Advocata, Murtaza Jafarji. Thank you very much, sir, for taking time off your busy schedule and joining us once again on Face the Nation. Let's get the ball rolling from the beginning. Poverty in Sri Lanka. Seven million families here in Sri Lanka living under the poverty line. Now, uh, Tanya, uh, as the president of the Sri Lanka Business United Forum, you work with a lot of small and medium scale businesses. And these are some of the hardest hit businesses here in Sri Lanka. So let's start off with a look at the situation on the ground. What does it really look like? Charlin, uh, the situation on the ground is it's virtually uh, blue murder. When I say blue murder, when you said, we, you just mentioned saying that we have uh, the country as a whole, we have put ourselves into this. No, it's not we that put ourselves into this. It is the government and the central bank that put the country into this. It's not we. You should never say we because we were the people up to now trying to uphold the economy of the country while the government is still in the process of destroying the economy. Up to date, by the DDR, I mean, uh, by trying to uh, revolve the domestic debt uh, restructuring, that was also an illusion made by the government. Uh, for a period of, I don't know, five days, a drama that was set aside. And up to now, I don't feel there is nothing as, uh, as lucrative or anything good has come out of, out of it, other than uh, People who have benefited is people who are it or and aligned with the government. And when I say power, when you ask about the poverty level, yes, uh, because I represent the SMB. We are the biggest uh, economical strength of the country, where we contribute nearly 52 percent to the country's GDP. And uh, how else? Uh, I mean, workforce is about 4.5 million workforce in the country. So that's a huge number of workforce. But the saddest part is nearly 30 percent of these companies have now shut down. That means nearly 350,000 SMV companies have shut down. So and another 15 to 20 percent are struggling very badly and this is something we mentioned and we told and we urged the government nearly a year and a half ago when this drama started what you all are trying to do is trying to control a economical status called inflation where it was never there by suppressing the economy and that would never go a long way and today see what has happened the government is playing a drama and we are being pushed to a side and not heard of. I can go on and on because uh, this was even taken up in the parliament, the SMB. And mind you, when we had a debate of the national crisis, you know, there was not even 10% seated in parliament. So this is the pathetical situation where we call a government. And the central bank governor, I don't know, for whatever the reason, he is living in an illusion. 
I am strictly saying this because uh, there are reasons to, for me to say this because we have urged him not to do this over and over again. Now today the SMV is on the verge of, uh, I mean, being deteriorated uh, uh, nearly into about 50% out. So if one million people go out of work, just imagine what is going to be the plight of the country. Are they even thinking about this? This is something that they should take into consideration and this is something they should look into. I mean, they always talk about the economical situation of the world. If they are following economical status of developed country, they should be geared to do so within this show. You, could, you should walk the talk, not talk the talk. This government has always, every government has come into power and has this walk the talk. They never talk, they just, so end of the day, who is suffering? The country's economical backbone. Today, we are being pushed to a situation, tomorrow, this country will go down and they can't even think of getting this back on. If they don't face the problem today, there is no tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya Besundara. Uh, we now move our attention to Brahm Nicholas, economist. Uh, Brahm, uh, we're speaking about um, the poverty rate in Sri Lanka uh, at a time when uh, Sri Lanka's government has decided to embark on a um, very optimistic domestic debt optimization program. Now, we saw in Parliament um, that almost many parliamentarians were present for the debates. It was very active, the debates. Uh, but like Tanya said, uh, when the small and medium scale enterprise businesses or their plight was taken up for debate, only about 10% of parliamentarians 10 were seated in Parliament. So, as an economist, when you take domestic debt optimization, that entire process, you know, getting your house into order, and the focus that you have on the real people living in the country and their plight, do you think the government has got their priorities straight? Exactly that. Uh, the last thing you said uh, is, is where I have some concerns because I think amongst all these discussions of domestic debt restructuring, fiscal consolidation and you know the sort of policies that the IMF has come up with and the government is now pursuing, the more fundamental questions have been lost. You know, how are we going to, first of all, address the problems that brought us into this situation. And there, I think what is completely lost is one of the most important developments that Sri Lanka has had a trade deficit, meaning importing more than it exports for almost 40 years. And that trade deficit has been 10% of GDP on average. Now that has been a continuous loss of dollars out of the country. And we know that in the end, what really brought Sri Lanka to its knees was the fact that we couldn't pay the foreigners the debt they were owed. And that was the dollar situation. So a plan to you know, create some sort of dynamism where there's sustainable uh, dollar earnings by Sri Lankan companies I don't see that strategy uh, yet. In fact, I think the worry now is that some of the more, say, short-term policies that they're focusing on are actually damaging uh, the long-term growth process. And so there we can see some of the ramifications have been high interest rates, uh, the raising of taxes. <coughs> I have to qualify that because it's not that I'm against raising the tax rate per se. I think there's a lot to be said about uh, the tax rate being too low over the past few years. But let's take, for instance, the raising of taxes on exporters to the point where there's no concession offered to them anymore. Now that I don't really don't understand. I mean, you're in a situation where your primary focus should be the dollar earnings of the country, because we know that that is really where the pain point was for Sri Lanka. <coughs> and to neglect it in such a manner, I mean, that's just one example, but there are quite a few others to name. Uh, and I'm worried, you know, that all of these discussions are basically missing the main point, 
which is what is the strategy for Sri Lanka's long-term growth, raising the living standards of the ordinary people, because that's really what we've seen in the successful developing countries around the world, where they have adopted certain policies that have managed to raise the ordinary people out of the poverty level seen there and really giving them good living standards. Uh, so that is my main concern at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Brahm Nicholas. We now move our attention to Bingumal uh, Thevara Pantri, the chairperson of the Sri Lanka Banks Association. Uh, Bingumal, now banks had a pretty good stint in the past five days given the fact that they were not included in the domestic debt optimization program. However, the people who were included in the domestic debt optimization program, mainly the participants in the EPF, uh, ETF uh, and, and other funds, pension funds in the country, uh, they were not really given a choice. Um, it was almost uh, forced upon them. And there was a lot of um, criticism that uh, the banks were not included in this process while poor people in the country the fund that is there to cushion their blow once they retire that that fund was hit so hard uh, hit so hard to a point where I believe it was said in Parliament that uh, the loss on the long term would be somewhere around 12 trillion, yeah, 12 so, trillion. so as the chairman of the Sri Lanka Banks Association and of course representative of the banks in Sri Lanka what do you feel about this situation? Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's right? Your time starts now. Yeah, well, thanks, Alan. So very quickly, domestic debts are close to 40 billion, basically 50% of our debt pile. And uh, getting that restructured was critical for us to manage the cash flows and the you know expenses. Uh, specifically to meet the GFN targets, cross financing is targets set at 13% hmm. by 2027. Uh, also, we needed $17 billion debt, you know, debt relief on the total debt pile. So, when we initially, I think when the government looked at uh, the debt pile, they thought they can exclude the domestic debts. Uh, some of us said you can't do that, some said you can do that, but after I think uh, six, seven months of analysis and after talking to different people, government has come to a conclusion that you had to do some amount of uh, DDO to take the, you know, to get a debt relief. So. <clears throat> Uh, if you look at who has taken the larger hit, it's a central bank. Central bank NPV cuts are much larger than the EPF in my view. Uh, central bank uh, hold about 2.6 trillion worth of uh, you know T-bills. Oh, yeah, 60 percent of the T-bills held by central bank going through a reprofiling. So there's a larger NPV cut to central bank. We will have to reprofile in central. I mean, recapitalize central bank as well. Um, why the banks we excluded again we did a lot of scenario planning to understand if we if a, if a bank goes through a do do or what will happen to a bank so then we realized there's a day one impact there is a you know impact to the cash flows uh, based on the discount rates there's a day one impact when you reprofile a t bond in a bank then we also realized larger part of the bond portfolios with state banks then probably state realized how do we look after every entity you have epf you have state banks you have you have the central bank so uh, I think after a careful analysis, the government has taken a call to exclude the banks because the challenge is with a day one impact in some of the banks, capital would have gone by 50%. So if you don't have... Overnight. Overnight. If you don't have proper regulatory forbearance and if you don't have a stability fund, that's what some of the other markets have done. When Jamaica did a DDO or a DDR, they had a stability fund. Oh, the banks didn't use it, but they had the fund. So uh, Ghana did a DDO, they had a regulatory forbearance, they managed it uh, in a different manner. Ghanaian uh, T-bonds again held, was, I mean, a larger part of that was held by uh, different banks, even international banks had the T-bonds. Our situation is slightly different. There are few banks concentrated, so I think they were worried that a bank might go down if we do a DDO. Looking at the larger impact to the economy, uh, they decided to exclude the banks. Now, again, looking at the banking industry in the last four years, banking industry had done reasonably well, in our view. We had current moratoriums from 2019 after post-COVID and now the, after that, the COVID-related you know, moratoriums and the economic crisis, so moratoriums ended. Uh, so bank uh, ROEs have now come down to 8.9, less than 
Generally, I imagine my market banking sector ROAs would have around 14 to 15 percent if you are looking at investors coming into the sector. So we are low from a return perspective right now. The profits have come down by 13 percent in the sector. More than anything, I think that we can manage more than anything. The NPLs have now gone up to 13.2 percent, and we believe we have not hit the bottom yet. Now, banks are very actively looking at restructuring some of the loans. So within the toxic portfolios, we don't know how many of them will settle, how many of them, like Tanya mentioned, I mean, larger part of these companies have now gone down. So we have a larger responsibility to make sure that we give enough leeway, restructure, give enough term it out, some of these, you know, you know, short term facilities, uh, look at whatever you can recover and work with those clients. I think there's a larger responsibility there. Mm. Uh, so yes, banks are excluded, but the good news is post DDO you have seen the interest rates, you know, crashing. Uh, so I expect the banking sector to bring the interest rates down and to, again to Tanya's uh, issue around lending and, you know, lending at high rates. Uh, I, I, think, I think banks should bring the rates down and participate in the economy better. Thank you very much, Bingamal. And finally, for the opening statement, we turn to I Mr. Just, uh, Lil, I want to butt into what uh, uh, this will we'll, we'll reserve space in the next round for the opening statement. Let's go to uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Jafarji, uh, Chairman of Advocata. Mr. Jafarji, there's a lot being said about the domestic debt optimization program. Uh, there are those who say it's pointless. There are those who say it's useless. There are those who say it should be done. Where do you stand? on this spectrum. So thank you, first of all, for inviting me once again to your program. <laughs> I believe I first came to this program about two years ago, and I did caution your viewers that Sri Lanka was facing an insolvency crisis. The policymakers at that time was treating this as a liquidity crisis, that it was catalyzed by COVID, which was not the case because Sri Lanka had been vulnerable for a very long time. And catalyst, uh, I mean, COVID was simply the catalyst that pushed us over the precipice. The last time you asked me to come here was about over two months ago, where I explained what the, the challenge Sri Lanka faces. So let me first start by reiterating uh, what I said. Uh, we have three problems with our debt. One is it's excessively high at 128% of GDP, which is called the public debt includes the central government debt, it includes the guaranteed debt of state-owned enterprises, and it includes the debt of the central bank. Uh, there is no specific red line, but we should generally, a middle-income market access country like us, should have a debt to GDP lower than somewhere in the range 60 to 70 percent or lower than that. So we were carrying a large amount of debt coming into this. Uh, it is estimated that this year, the interest burden was going to be close to two trillion. Now, you can assume that our GDP is about uh, 25 trillion, which works out to about 8% eight uh, 8 of GDP, which is an excessively high amount of interest to GDP. The third factor is because of the crisis, we started issuing more and more of our domestic securities in shorter dated securities. So there is the concept of gross financing needs, which is that whatever your deficit at what is called the primary deficit revenue minus expenditure without interest, plus what you have to roll over. And the rollover challenge became higher and higher because we started issuing more and more short-term securities. Uh, my estimate is on the domestic debt, it was about average term to maturity of three years, that you had a very, very high gross financing requirement, partly to fund a very large primary balance deficit, which was estimated to about 3.7% of GDP. And you had to pay for the amortization, which last year was estimated the GFN at something like 33, was about 28%. It is estimated that the GFN was going to go up to 37. And in the absence of any kind of restructuring, even if you were able to wait till inflation subsided, which is happening, uh, the path at which the gross financing needs was going to reduce was still going to be significantly higher than the level that the IMF had set for us at 19%. So the IMF set three to four parameters on our debt because their evaluation said before they gave us the funds that your debt is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So they told us very clearly that you will have to restructure your debt. They said you'll have to restructure your external debt, and there is a gap which probably will require the domestic debt also to be restructured. 
So, in the external debt, they have said that you have to uh, restrict it to 4.5% of GDP, uh, the debt servicing. And they also said that there is a financing gap of $17 billion and you will have to get some debt relief to pay for that $17 billion, which means that there will have to be some kind of interest and principal right now. In the domestic debt, uh, they are required to be what is called reprofiling, which means that not necessarily you have to cut the principal amount, but you have to extend the maturity and reduce some of the coupons. Mm -hmm. So, in the absence of any kind of restructuring, the, the trajectory was that our cross financing needs was going to be about 19 percent if we didn't do anything. So, which was yet higher than the 13 percent which was set as a target. So, our focus was that our primary balance which was a deficit of 3.7 percent of GDP had to be elevated to 2.3 percent surplus, which is almost a 6 percent swing, which is an extremely challenging thing because the primary balance target of 2.3, in a history, 75 years or more post-independence history, only five instances we have ever uh, posted a primary balance surplus, two times in the 1950s, once in 1991 and once in 2017 and 18. The highest we got to was 0.8. And there's also allegations about 2018 when we got to it that we got to 0.8 percent with arrears. Now we have to sustain at the rate of 2.3 percent primary balance surplus, which is an extremely challenging thing. Therefore, even if we got to that, uh, you had to get relief of 2.4 percent of GDP from the external debt servicing, which means maturity extensions, principal haircuts, and some kind of adjustment to the coupons. The rest was 1.5 percent which had to be got from the domestic debt optimization, out of which the central bank debt optimization was going to give you 0.9, so they have something like 2.5 trillion, which was now extended, the proposal is to extend it over 15 years, the first servicing will happen in 5 years, and the last in 15 years. Uh, the second was that they targeted the uh, uh, superannuation funds, which own 43 percent of the bonds. And the last was a very little bit, 0.1 percent of GDP from the Sri Lanka development bonds and what are called FCBU loans. FCBU loans are basically dollar loans made to the government. So the superannuation funds were asked to adjust by 0.5 percent. After the 43 percent holdings of bonds, 33 percent is the EPF. The ETF is about 5 to 6 percent. Mm. The balance is there are lots of other smaller private sector pension funds, even government, bank, etc. Mm. Different ones. So that's how you get the 43 percent. Now, the question is that you left out 57. Out of the 57, the banks are 55, right? So there were outside that, there was about another 12 to 13 percent, which were a whole bunch of other people, including individuals, corporations, government entities. The list is there. So that's what they were confronted with and what they had to do, they had no option. So if you were a policy maker, uh, your options was very bad and bad. <laughs> there is no good. And I would hate to be a policy maker. It's very easy for me to come on this television program and pontificate. This is very easy to talk. When you have to do and you are in the driver's seat, you have so many conflicting interests including a whole bunch of parliamentarians who have the benefit of parliamentary privilege and can shout and criticize, but don't understand. So they have an extremely difficult job and they had to work within those constraints. But then there are certain decisions that they made that perhaps I don't agree with. And that is that the perimeter should have been widened so that we would have got more relief and it would have been more equitable. We can discuss that later. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jafferji. Of course, a very comprehensive opening statement. Uh, let's get right into it. And today, to ask the right questions, we've got with us uh, Niresh Eliathambi. Uh, Niresh, the floor is all yours. Uh, yes. So I'd like to uh, open this up by asking Tanya. Uh, now, um, we seem to be losing sight of the bigger picture here when we're, we are uh, dealing with the nitty-gritties. But isn't it the bigger picture that in order for Sri Lanka and Sri Lankans to get out of this nightmare, which has been going on for about a, a year and a half now, to get out of this nightmare, 
don't we require proper economic growth rather than this recession, this contraction of the economy? And don't you, do you see the SME sector as being the biggest part of this? I feel the SMV was the biggest part that got affected. If you were to take uh, wholly, it's not the blue chip companies or not the multinational companies or the bigger companies, it's SMV. Because for the simple reason, SMVs are entities that always uh, go about starting their businesses on lended money, borrowed money, sorry. So 90% of the SMVs have been borrowed from the banking sector, keeping collateral as their own uh, properties and uh, uh, own assets, not assets that has been got from uh, foreign investors or assets that has been given through the government to their own asset to relate to the banking sector. No, the SMV, 99% of the SMV collateral is your own asset. I mean, 90% is your own homes, mind you. And then the workforce starts from a 50 to 600 employers under the SMV. Some have 800 if you were to take the garment industry. So like this gentleman was saying, as a banker, uh, the MPL level of the SMVs today has gone up to nearly 80% of the SMV companies are on MPL. Because no, because they are in a situation, because their liabilities are more than their turnover. Though the government at the moment thinks uh, the turnover is sustainable enough to uh, support the liabilities, absolutely no. With uh, the overheads, uh, with the excessive uh, interest, tax, and uh, 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 the dollar uh, inflation, and uh, not having enough raw materials to sustain your business. Now, it's the, all this come into a SMV's bucket because we are not a BOI company. We don't have access to direct imports. We have to depend on uh, finances that is available within the country uh, with, through a banking sector or go into an open market. So with the dollar crisis hitting on a sky level, we were pushed to a situation we could not you know, sustain our businesses. So that's what I said, 30% of the SMVs got totally crashed with this situation. Okay, the other 70%, whoever who was sustaining, now nearly another 20%, like I said in the open run, has got affected. And today, with the situation, what has happened is uh, with the dollar being floating and not stabilized into a situation, there are people, even we, my company, that I own. We have bought raw materials when the dollar was 420 rupees. Okay, and today the dollar is 320 to 30. So the deficit between the money we have spent to today, we have no way of recovering. And how are we going to facilitate our debts? So this is a huge question that I've been asking the central bank. Why are you all pushing us into this situation? You know, just before all this uh, crisis happened, we had a face-to-face -face meeting with the previous uh, president. You know, the governor was bold enough to tell us, if you can't shut down, if you can't retrench, and uh, you need to manage your funds, liquidate whatever you have, how much can a SMB liquidate? So now look at the situation where a government has put this country into it is like uh, it's very easy to talk about the bigger picture but the bigger picture is the people of this country who put this country into this economical status i mean everybody cannot come and say it's now not our issue today because 90 percent of these people who are sitting on those chairs were there in these governing bodies, in all government, in different formats. So they all are responsible for today's situation. Tanya, you spoke about um, SMEs not being able to, you know, meet their debt obligations, especially to banks. Now, Bingamal, you were also speaking about the non-performing loans. MP, that's what I was trying to tell him. It's uh, nearly 80% are in the crib. 80% of SMEs. It's, so. Yeah. So they're in the it's, crib. Yeah, so when you're in so, the crib, you're not allowed to, you know, uh, take, go in for another facility from any f uh, financial institute. If you're in Wendy, so, so long you're in the crib, they will never give you financial support. So, so Bigubal, do you, you have any information about, um, you know, what 
really the banks are planning on doing on addressing this specific situation because SMEs are required for Sri Lanka to grow and we are looking to grow at a time when we are contracting. Yeah. Um, so is, is there any plans? I think the sector is deeply concerned about what, what the clients are going through, not only SMEs, there are large clients also struggling, some of the large clients and also individuals mm. because the individual taxes have gone up by 100% from mm. 18 to 36%. And the interest even, rates spiked overnight. Even, yeah, even if you're getting a 1 million salary, we say, your take home is now 400,000 with EPF, ETF, your taxes and your loans, some are like 300, 200,000, they can't even, they are leave out of, you know, their houses if they are on rent, so some even individuals are struggling, even at that salary level. So it's a huge stress right now for most of our clients, no doubt about it. Uh, but specifically about the 80% in the crib, uh, you go to crib when you delay your payments, so it's not that not necessary you are a stage 3 loan. So what I mentioned at 13.3 is a stage 3 loan, you know, you're gone, default. Uh, you're not paying three. at all. Yeah, you're basically yeah, gone to stage 3 and, and as you know, a percentage of the larger portfolio, it's about 13.2% over a trillion dollar rupees from that perspective. So it's tough for the banks as well. It's more than that actually. Now this is because we are restructured and restructured and restructured. You don't really see the real picture. Uh, I think it's much more than that. In some of the banks it's much higher, some of the banks slightly lower. Uh, I, I think the banks got a role to play. Now the rates have come down. The other problem we had was that when the rates were at 25, 30%, how do you restructure? At what rate do you restructure? <laughs> Even if you restructure, how can you pay? Your cash flows are not sufficient, Tani is right. Your cash flows are not sufficient to settle your restructured loan. So um, I think that you know, with the rates coming down, I think we have to see, again relook at our portfolios and return out whatever possible. But for the clients, again, uh, both goes, it goes both ways. So clients also, I've seen, you know, the SMEs or even the corporates uh, go into investments after investments when they see opportunity. They do leverage buyouts without planning a lot. So for a crisis of this nature, starting from East attacks, so now it's about four years. Uh, companies are not geared enough to manage it. Starting with MSMEs, about a million entities in total, uh, plus the other com larger companies, uh, not a, a larger part of that is not ready for this kind of crisis, sadly. We've seen this in Zambia, we've seen this in Ghana, Pakistan is going through it now. Uh, so when the country is in stress for a very long time, it's very difficult to manage if you're not planning your cash flows properly. Mm -hmm. Banks also got a responsibility when you're lending to clients, when you see opportunities, you keep on lending, giving them ideas. You're running a hardware store, suddenly you see a software, some opportunity to set up a lodge. Mm -hmm. We have seen that a lot, right? Mm -hmm. You're in a distribution business, suddenly you start a hotel business, leverage start a hotel business simply because the rates were like 8%, 7%. Everybody says tourism will take off, let's go for it. Billion rupees, now who's going to pay that? So I think both got, uh, I mean, at least for the future, got a responsibility in terms of picking your battles and you know understanding your strengths and sticking to your core business model without trying to diversify just because another, you know, your friend is doing it, your relative is doing it, your company is doing it. Uh, that should not be the way. But coming back to the point uh, of the larger toxic portfolio, banks will have to keep on restructuring. Uh, the, the facilities that we can recover, sadly, some are beyond repair. They'll have to you know, sell their assets, move on, get into other businesses. Uh, the other entities who are you know, almost, they are somehow managing, uh, we'll have to seriously look at the business models. If they see you know, uh, they're in the, in the model, a particular business not doing well, you might have to downsize, you might have to take a step back, you might have to exit certain sectors uh, and, and, you know, uh, and build for the future more than anything but, else. But hasn't that pretty much already happened? I mean, people who, uh, especially SMVs, they, they are mainly existing via shoestring. They've, they've sold their vehicles, um, they, they've, they've, you know, people are going to the to the neighborhood Polimudalali, who's giving at 10% a month or, or even more. Uh, it, it's got that bad. Uh, how, how much further could they restructure? And what is the government's role in this? Uh, you know, because, uh, Tanya, could, could you tell me yeah. what the government is doing to facilitate uh, this? Like Neomal said, restructuring should be done, but by restructuring or downsizing, would our liabilities be downsized? That's what we ask in the government. That's what we ask the government. I mean, uh, like, like uh, uh, 
like a banker, he was very correctly emphasizing on it. And I respect him for understanding the same way he's applied. But the government does not understand this because they have to realize when our assets are being liquidated, when our assets are being taken by the institutes, it is our personal assets. They, they, they lose their homes what they're living in. But this does not happen to the big companies who are undergoing. Their personal assets are never being touched because that's not their collateral. This is the gravity of the SMV who has been the economical backbone without any support from the government. SMVs have never asked any help from the government any time in their life. Atani, since you mentioned big cooperations, just a quick question to Bingamal. Um, there has been this allegation that big companies, especially companies who have, how can we say it, let's say friends in high places, have been getting their debts written off in the billions. Any comment on that? This was debated in the Public Finance Committee as well. There's not enough data. There are allegations on certain names. I'm not aware of anything. Uh, there are few in the public domain people are talking about it, but uh, we've not seen any report around simply writing off because of a friendship. Uh, because banks, at least the private banks, you know, you, they, I mean, they got boards and investors behind it. Mm. Uh, it's not that easy to take those calls due to mm. political pressure. Um, Mr. Jafarji, now, Sri Lanka is undergoing this domestic debt optimization program at a time when Sri Lanka has, has hit its lowest. Um, now, initially, the government wasn't very clear on what their plan was uh, because the initial position of the government, I believe, that they you know, so vociferously put out into the public was that, no, we are not going to restructure domestic debt. Do not worry. Then when the EPF and the EPA, uh, ETF was brought up, they said, no, do not worry. We are not going to touch the ETF. We are not going to touch the EPF. But now they have done the exact opposite of what they said. How does this blend into everything that's happening right now? So you have to always utterances of various government officials uh, sometimes are contradictory. So many of the parliamentarians or ministers basically they don't read their brief and they say certain things without really understanding what they are saying. So you should treat many of the utterances with a pinch of salt. Now let's let's see what was done, right? So if you take the domestic debt optimization, the provident funds, uh, which was categorized as superannuation funds, 43% was uh, subject to what they have called domestic debt optimization. Uh, I don't have the exact bond holdings of them, right? Mm. So it was the bonds that were uh, reprofiled. There is about nine trillion of that, and 43%. So what I did is I went to the EPF and looked at the notes to their accounts and they give you a maturity profile of their holdings. Hmm. Um, and then based on what the bonds are outstanding, I kind of tried to impute what their bond portfolio would look like. And what we did is that uh, we took what was offered to them because it was a swap, right? So you take all the bonds and you swap it for a new set of bonds. Mm. Right. And then they had different cash flow profile with different timings. So and different interest rates. Uh, yes. Uh, now the interesting thing is some of the interest rates were higher than what the bonds they were holding. So mm. they would have been holding certain bonds at 5%, 6%, 7%. It was all exchanged to these two-step coupons that they'd get 12.5%, I think, for another two years. Nine, 12 percent, yeah, 12, and from 2030, 9%. 9%, 9, 9 thereof. thereafter. Yeah. So, took all these bonds, basically. Now, how we do it in finance is because all the cash flows are at different times and at different rates, etc. That if you want to get a point estimate, you use a very basic methodology called uh, net present value, which means that you take all the cash flows and you adjust for the time value of money and you get a point estimate. We did that at different types of interest rates, assuming that there's a parallel shift in the yield curve. And the numbers that we got were not significantly different. So I think you mentioned that they lost 12 trillion or something. I don't know how that is possible. 
because I'm estimating that the member balances of the EPF middle of the year is about 3.7 trillion. So the, 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 the assertion was that they will lose 12 trillion yeah. in the long run. Uh, so I don't know, I mean, unless, I, I don't know how they came to that estimate, but I looked at it on a comparable because you have to compare apples with up apples. Mm -hmm. The NPV methodology is perhaps the best way to do that. Uh, and when we did that, we found that there was a small difference. Small difference meaning a step down? Uh, y yes, a, a small difference, uh, which was not significantly going to be different. Hmm. And it all depends on, you know, when you are going to retire and, you know, the performance is all going to be very different, you know, hmm. because some, you have young people, old people, so it's one combined thing. But it's hard um, to take all of these factors into consideration. It's difficult. So you have to look at the whole thing as a fund. Right? Understood. So, so when we did that, uh, we got an analysis that they were not adversely worse off. Hmm. Right? There was a marginal difference. Hmm. Hmm. I would say less than five percent. Okay. Okay. Um, so the government also came out and said that uh, long term we will do nine percent. Now, if the new central bank law goes into uh, law, uh, they will have to adhere to something called an inflation target, which going by the past, it's about 4 to 6%. Mm. So 4 to 6%, let's say 5%, and there's something called the real yield, how much you get more than inflation. 2% mm. is like the global thing. And then there's a term premium, which means that because you are locking your money for a longer period, you should be rewarded with a slightly higher interest rate. It will roughly come to about 9%, which is the 9% that has been recommended. So you're saying the inflation will hit about 9? No, 5. 5. Okay. Inflation target is 4 to 6. Oh, okay. okay. Right? The Western world is at 2. Okay. Right? But they're not getting it now. It's all, all the variables have gone all over the place. So when you look at that, there's a misunderstanding that the superannuation funds didn't get a bad deal. It's just that you are stretching out the cash flows to help these cross financing needs and that's not going to be impactful for them because how they fund themselves is that the contributions far exceed the outflows the people who retire the contribute because inflation all the salaries have gone up so when they are contributing it's still they get a positive cash inflow hmm. So, so technically, Mr. Jafferji, just to put this into simple terms, uh, the number of people retiring and the money required to pay them their EPF, ETF, is far, far, far less than the amount that's collected through contributions yeah, every I, year. Every I, I won't say far, far less. Last year in the EPF, if my memory serves me correct, there was a surplus of about 30 billion. 30 billion. Yeah. And that will only get impacted if there's a dramatic change in the age structure. But, but that now, was, was... No, but they're pushing the retirement age further and further. You can't retire at 55, you know, if you're living till like 80. So in most countries, how you solve this problem is to push the age. Hmm. Because people, nobody really retires at 55. I mean, most people work till at least 65 or more, even if they lose employment in their primary place of work. So the, it is a myth that the superannuation funds got a bad deal. Hmm. That is not true, and I'm coming on your program and saying very clearly that they didn't. My issue is the other 57%. That, why did you exempt? So, Including the banks? Uh, yes. So, I don't agree with Bingo. <laughs> uh, for the reason, and I'll explain to you this. You see, there is an accounting issue, hmm. because we are in the realms of what is called fair value accounting. So what would have done is if they had forced this kind of swap uh, because the EPF would have a different profile of securities. They would have more longer term securities. Mm. The banks would probably have shorter. So I don't have uh, per, per bond series who owns what. Mm. We just know the total. Mm. But it's not equally distributed across all the different classes that they classify. Mm. So the banks, and I used to be on a bank director for nine years, so I have some understanding of how that industry works, is then basically spread game. So they get interest income on the interest earning assets, which is mainly lending to the private sector. And then they also hold a fixed income portfolio because by the Banking Act, 20% of their liabilities have to be in liquid securities, of which government securities are one type. So a lot of them, but they're holding much more than the 20%.
But the benefit that they get is that when you hold these government securities, which are called risk-free securities, you need to put capital against your interest earning assets. This is zero risk weighted. So you don't have to put capital against the holding of government securities. Right? Mm. So you get a huge benefit. Uh, now, the question is that since they're in a spread game, if these were reprofiled and they ended up getting slightly lower coupons, uh, if interest rates are coming down, and already it is going to come down, now tomorrow I believe there is a monetary policy meeting and it's expected that there will be a cut in interest rates and more because inflation is coming down very, very quickly, expected to hit single digits by next month, uh, they could have managed that spread. So if you didn't do this, the shareholders benefited from not touching that because ultimately the residual flows to the shareholders. Now the question is that they have other problems, which is very true because they said that over 20% of the lending book has some kind of stress. Then I also don't agree the, with this thing that you know they have a higher tax burden because they are paying 30% corporate tax like every other company. The 18% financial VAT that they pay is more visible in the income statement because unlike a normal business, they don't get input credit and output credit. The VAT that finally the consumer pays is the same whether it's a bank or uh, uh, a normal goods and services company because it gets built into the cost of interest. You know, either depositor will get slightly lower interest or lend, uh, borrower will get slightly higher interest. So technically income. it's not it's not going out of the bank's pocket? It's not. It's not going out of the shareholder's pocket. Okay. It's a pass-through. It's a pass-through. So this argument that they have a very high tax burden, I don't agree. And I also don't agree with the fact that the EPF has a lower tax burden, superannuation thing, because the average balance of an EPF holder is only 1.8 billion. If you take the total and divide by 2.5 million. Hmm. And it probably it's skewed towards 90% of the people probably have small balances. You have very rich people and older people who probably have much higher balances. So when you look at that, you need 185,000 rupees monthly income to get to a tax rate of 12%. If you say that the, the superannuation funds are passed through vehicles, most of them would have anyway been below that 12% uh, mm. tax rate. So I don't agree that they have a tax advantage. And I also don't agree that the banks are excessively taxed. Now, they do have an issue with their lending book and COVID, etc., and moratoriums were given. Actually, if the moratoriums were not mandated, they would have anyway had to give these moratoriums, right? And they got regulatory forbearance that they didn't have to impair. So, there is no easy solutions to this. Uh, you know, the actual thing lies somewhere and some compromise would have to have received. So my sense is that if we extend it, and then outside the bank, so many other people got left out, including individuals who, who made very, very high returns. So the question is that now the government will have to continue to service those very, very high interest rate bonds that were issued. Out of the 8 trillion, about 1.9 trillion was in this distressed mm. era. About 25, 20 25. So that's a coupon, mm. over 20 to 30%. Yeah. Right? So the, now the thing is that if you continue to service that, it will either have to come in you paying more taxes or somebody else, the, uh, the expenditure will have to be cut from government services. So the whole dilemma in this, with all the other comments, the other people, is this in this unmitigated crisis, how are we going to distribute the adjustment? Hmm. So if 36% of national income is amongst 10% of the top households, and if 51% of national income is amongst the top 20% of households, that is probably skewed more when you look at the wealth, the wealthy should be taking the majority of the burden. So my philosophical issue here is that you can't excessively profit from a crisis <laughs> when so many people in your country are suffering. Absolutely. Mr. Jafarji was, was incidentally uh, pointing towards Bingumal when he was <laughs> referring to the rich. Can, can, can I? <laughs> no, we always have this Can debate. I ask a question here of Bingumal? Uh, Bingumal, uh, now Mr. Jafarji uh, referred to interest, uh, uh, sorry, inflation rates coming down and the target would be 4 to 6 percent and also that interest rates are now coming down. What is your projection for interest rates, um, say, for the rest of uh, the year? 
Yes, yeah, so I the inflation will no, no, inflation will hit single digit by next month. It's done really. I well. think already food inflation yeah, is so hit. Yeah, so there's base effect also kicking in. So but what about the bank lending rates? Lending so rates. I mean, T bill one year rates are hovering around 13, 14 percent now. As of today, they'll we also believe that there'll be a policy rate cut. Uh, Would it be a drastic cut? Are we, are we grilling we you cannot, too much information? We can <laughs> speculate at this point, but I think the large expectation is a rate cut. There will be a couple of those uh, mm -hmm. before the year end. So my guess so is it's about 2%. Okay. Yeah. The rate cut? Uh, 200 basis points. Okay, okay. Okay. And, and how would that translate into yeah, so the AWPLR should, SMEs yeah, and PLR so should AWPLR should come down to 14-15% in the next three months and to land at around 12% by end of this year. So SME rate will be something like 16% by end of this year, ideally. So Bingama, getting back to what uh, Mr. Jafferji was saying about um, the deal that the um, superannuation funds got and the EPF, the ETF got, he said they didn't get a bad deal, is what he said. So if, the, if they didn't get a bad deal, wouldn't that also mean that if the banking sector was also included in this program, they also wouldn't have gotten, well, a really bad deal to a point where banks would have been at risk of collapsing, which was the argument that was put forward when questioned on why banks were excluded from the entire domestic debt optimization program. Yes, sure. Shalin, difficult to explain because we don't know the individual banks and what they were holding. The and based on their capital levels, what would be the capital erosion. Mm. Uh, there had been about 100 debt restructuring in the last 20 plus years. Uh, one third of those have gone into uh, DDR. Uh, one third of that go have gone into banking sector crisis. Right? But very clearly when you do a T-bill reprofiling, we have clearly seen in Russia in early 2000s, it was a massive crisis. But even without T-bills, only with T-bonds, there have been few banking sector crises in the last 20 plus years. So there is a risk there. So I'm, I'm sure the central bank carefully looked at the impact to individual banks, because remember they also did asset quality review for five banks, they added another four banks. They probably did all these simulations to understand what will happen in a reprofiling scenario. It all depends on the discount rate and the day one impact and how you amortize that, how you communicate more than anything else. Mm -hmm. right? We have seen once, uh, with few negative comments, one bank at some point had a cash outflow in the last two years. Uh, just you know, for a couple of days and thank God it stopped. Uh, so these things can happen in a smaller market and Sri Lanka has not seen a like a bank going down actually interestingly other than Pramukha cessation uh, Ceylon once had a bit of a stress but it was rescued very well uh, unlike other markets Sri Lanka is very unique from that perspective last hundred years we have not seen a bank going into a bankruptcy so if a, if a bank run happens we don't know how Sri Lankans will react and we've seen how other markets have reacted. So that, I think those are the risk elements that they looked at. And sadly, I mean, the thing is, we are also IFRS country and we are you know, Basel III and all of that, right? So we, we have to follow the protocol. We cannot just, you know, amortize the way we want. We cannot do those things. We have to take the day one loss. We have to do a capital erosion. Only way to manage that is if we did a bank restructuring it regularly for barrels, manage the communication well, make sure that the vulnerable banks are supported with a stability fund. Uh, whether we have the money for that, I don't know. Uh, so, so the banks seem to be um, justifiably, of course, uh, well protected. Um, but uh, Tanya, would you like that same level of protection for the SMV sector, Absolutely. which has yeah. to take the country out of this economic? Uh, uh, when I, when uh, these two gentlemen was talking about the inflation coming down, inflation has not really come down. It has been forcibly suppressed because of the consumer market has come down. Consumer market has dropped up to 60%. So now what has happened is we have uh, more stuff in the market than people can buy, sort of things. So it is, that is where it's, it's an illusion why I say. It is forcibly suppressed to show the inflation has been controlled. The inflation is not controlled at all. You got to go into the real world. Mind you, none of these people who sit on these seats are in the real world then they would realize you go into any b try at looking at a basic uh, uh, um, uh, bag of groceries and then you will realize if the inflation is really gone down or it's been suppressed today people don't have the funds to purchase 
So if you don't have the funds to purchase, how can you say the inflation has gone down? No, it is not. It is very easy for these people to say it is not. It has been suppressed forcibly and up to now it is the case. And mind you, give it another couple of months, this is going to be blown out of further out of proportion. And then let's see how this government is going to say the inflation is being controlled. No, that's why we are urging the government, do not do what you're doing right now. If you suppress the SMV so badly, this, uh, this illusion of yours saying that the inflation is being controlled is not. Because today, the consumer market has more goods than what they can sell. Even up to now, the market has been open and goods are coming in. Uh, so what? They are not being manufactured in Sri Lanka, 90%. I mean, more, why is our problem? Like this gentleman said, we do more imports than exports. So there is always a trade deficit of more than 8 to 10 billion. So, so up to now, when we say we do not have dollars, we are still importing what is not necessary into the country and trying to show the, uh, the economy is being controlled and the inflation is being uh, controlled. No, the reality is way beyond this. The real reality is not that. To do so, you go into the ground level and have a look. Now, um, many of the, or most of the SMVs uh, actually employ young people. Uh, am I correct? Um, the mainly uh, a lot of unskilled youngsters who come out of school and so on, they do get opportunities in SMVs. Uh, but if you go to uh, the passport office in Batramulla on any uh, working day, you will see thousands of young people trying, uh, to, escape trying the country. to leave the country. Um, and I believe, Shalan, was it 917,000 uh, passports issued last year? and uh, definitely it will be more than that this year. So uh, I'd like to bring uh, our young economist in here uh, and ask uh, how does a country recover from this kind of economic situation if the young people who are expected to drive the growth are leaving the country? I, I really wonder at the statistics of this if you have nearly a million leaving, most of them young people. You know, we, we don't have that many people being born in this country in a year. So what's going to happen if this continues on like this? This, this, this brain drain or labor drain, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there, uh, I don't know the exact details of how many people have left the country, but you know, it's, it's difficult when you talk to a young, uh, a person in Sri Lanka uh, and they're telling you, you know, I want to leave the country, there are no prospects here, uh, I don't see the point in sticking around and I'm just going to try my best in another country. Difficult to tell them at this point that they have something to stick around for. And I think there, I also find it difficult to defend uh, the policies that are now in place because this this obsession with uh, all the austerity measures, the IMF policies, I don't understand it. You know, how, how many times does Sri Lanka have to go through this same thing over and over again before it learns that the IMF is not the answer? And every time I say this, I hear the exact same response, which is, oh, we didn't follow through with all the IMF's recommendations. Now this actually reminds me of, uh, well, or conjures up the image in my head of uh, sending out a boxer into the uh, fighting ring, telling him to fight with one arm behind his back, punches start flying in from the opponent, and then obviously he removes his arm from his back to start fighting properly, and you say at the end of the match, ah, see, you didn't stick to the rules, you didn't hold that arm behind your back. You know, it's, that's what it looks like for me, is you're asking Sri Lanka to fight with one arm behind its back with the measures that are now in place. Because there should be some support structure for these SMEs and there should be some plan to promote 
their development is into there export a, oriented is there such a plan? companies. Not that I'm aware of, and it, it needs to be aggressive and on the large scale. And you know, that's where we really need to look at some of the successful countries around the world and say, okay, look, what is it that they have done? Because we can name over 70 developing countries throughout uh, modern history that have gone to the IMF, adopted exactly the same type of policies and gone nowhere. And usually they go back. You know, we can name the extreme examples of Argentina and Greece, you know, that have been disasters. But what we really should be doing is looking at the success stories. Incidentally, that are not averse to working with the IMF if you look at Korea, they took a massive loan from the IMF in 1997. But the difference with, between Korea then and Sri Lanka now is that Korea had its own plan. Its own plan to develop export-oriented industrialization. And it put or had already put in place hundreds of policies that were going to make their companies competitive and they were going to support them in the global arena. And it wasn't just that, it was also trying to get some of the foreign companies to start working with their domestic companies, invite them over, give them the concessions that they need so that they want to produce in your country. I mean, look no further than Vietnam at this moment in time. They are getting Samsung in there. They've gotten Intel in there. The Apple has recently gone in there. They're getting some of the car companies in. And they're not, not just saying, look, we're giving you concessions yep. and you can profit from us and that's it. They want something in return. And they're getting it. They're getting cooperation with their domestic companies who are learning from the foreign companies. And one example now, did you know that Vietnam now has actually produced its own EV car that is hitting the US markets? I mean, this is Vietnam, who 50 years ago was being blasted to bits by the Americans, has now struggled, come up from nothing, and developed its own car manufacturing entity, who are now producing EVs and exporting them successfully. And you should see some of the cars, you know, they're in incredible, they look fantastic. But the point there being is why don't we look more at the successful countries and do what they did? Not exactly, because every country will do it a bit differently, but the basics are there. You have to support your companies to export, and you have to focus on these two things. Get dollar earnings, because we don't want to run into this situation again where we can't pay off the foreign creditors and we have a, a crisis that you know, results in a collapse of the exchange rate and all the inflation that comes with it. You know, and, and now we're talking about all these problems, but where can they be traced back to in the end? You know, that was this one fundamental problem. Sri Lanka has never industrialized. Actually, let me qualify that. It did happen once, and we were talking about it before the show. President Premadasa actually started an aggressive export-oriented industrialization strategy in the 1990s. And I have to wonder where Sri Lanka would be if its manufacturing champions in the garments industry weren't there to do the bare minimum. You know, if those export earnings weren't there, where would Sri Lanka be? So you can see how far that even went. President Premadasa, of course, only tragically got four years to do what he wanted to do. But the effects of his policy can still be seen today. Why has it never been taken up again? You know, need not even look at other countries, look at your own history. You know, it has happened here, but now we need the global context. You can't just go down the garments route because this is what Bangladesh is doing, not diversified uh, export-oriented production. And the successful countries actually do that diversification. So they get into all manner of electronics, plastics, chemicals, all of it, so that they don't rely on one particular product and they don't get hit 
by outside forces as much as the non-industrializing. Value-added exports. Now, now, we are told time and time again that we need to get past this particular crisis that we are in, but it's been 18 months already. Uh, before we can take off, uh, is, is that so? Is it mutually exclusive? I mean, can't both go hand in hand? Can't we uh, take these uh, austerity steps in some way, yes, um, but at the same time push the industrialization, uh, especially through SMVs? Uh, can't these go hand in hand? They can. And, uh, Very much. You know, to bring it up again, Vietnam is the perfect example. In 2006, it had a very severe financial crisis. And the IMF actually stepped in to provide its support and asked for some restructuring measures. But the Vietnamese never gave up on their plan to industrialize. And so we have the examples that it can happen. But I think the problem is that Sri Lanka does not have its own plan. And when that is the case, you are very susceptible to others suggesting what you should and shouldn't do. So things are being asked that, in my opinion, shouldn't be asked. Now, we're supposed to also talk about the DDR, the domestic debt restructuring. I have a slightly different take from Murtaza on this, where I would ask some serious questions as to whether it was necessary in the first place. Because as you brought up, in the beginning, there was no plan to actually do it. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, it emerged that, oh, this is something that the foreign creditors are asking for. They want this because they want some equal treatment or some sort of equal treatment when we're talking about foreign and domestic debt uh, investors. I don't see any justification for that because they are two completely different assets. An international investor knows the risks when they're investing in dollar-denominated developing country bonds like Sri Lanka's ISPs. And they get compensated for that extra risk that they take. So for example, foreign investor comes to Sri Lanka in 2014 and wants to invest in government debt. Now, they have the option to also invest in rupee-denominated debt. But they don't because they know that they're going to lose out in dollar terms. Because, you see, the rupee is constantly depreciating against the dollar. And so what the Sri Lankan government then says is, look, we'll give you these dollar-denominated ISBs, but they carry a risk because we don't print dollars. We print rupees and we get tax income in rupees, not in dollars. So that is a clear risk that the investors are taking. And on average, we calculated if they would have invested in ISPs in 2014, they get something like a 6.7% annual return. If they would have invested that same money in rupee denominated debt, they would have gotten minus 4%. And now, they want equal treatment, you know, no risk, but all the rewards. And I find that very strange. And, you know, this argument that we have to listen to them because otherwise this, that and the other. I mean, come on, there are limits to what Sri Lanka can give away. I mean, next thing you know, they'll be asking for candy and we'll be but giving away that, that's you why know. That's the government is there to fight back. Exactly, and it should be in our interest and also not with this fear-based decision-making where it's, you know, what if and then crisis will emerge. But I think having said that, there's one last thing I want to bring in and that is that I think there needs to be a qualification when we're talking about debt levels, whether they're sustainable or not and also in terms of their uh, financing interest cost. Because for me, domestic currency debt and foreign currency debt are two completely different things. As I said just now, 
the government does not get tax returns in dollars and it cannot print uh, dollars. So the sustainability of the two is clearly very, very different. So I don't quite understand how the two can be consolidated and you're talking about this general debt sustainability. And I think those need to be separated where we say, look, we defaulted on dollar denominated debt. Why? Not because the government had uh, budgeting issues, but because the country ran out of dollars. So we can see there it's a completely different thing. And then the final thing I wanted to say is, I, I believe Bingo Ma was already saying it, that interest rates are coming down. Now, so I asked the question, is the DDR necessary in the first place? Now it's being done. But then I'm wondering, you're doing it on the central bank. Why? They are holding mostly treasury bills. These would have matured within, at, uh, at the maximum, one year. Now, when they mature, the central bank can simply refinance, or sorry, the government can choose to refinance the debt, issue longer term debt, which the central bank then takes on. Notice, not a single extra rupee needs to be printed. They just exchange the short term debt for longer debt without any restructuring taking place. You see what I'm talking about? It's why was the restructuring necessary if this was going to happen anyway? And then we're talking of them exchanging treasury bills that had an interest of 30% for now long-term bonds that are carrying something like 14% uh, on them. So they would have naturally reduced the government's interest burden. So why the restructuring? Brahm, interesting proposition. Uh, Ms. Jaffrici, do you want to respond? So naturally, I'm going to disagree. First of all, I'm going to disagree with Tanya's assertion about the inflation. You see, Milton Friedman famously said that inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And the reason that we had inflation in Sri Lanka was there was excess amount of money chasing too few goods because the central bank went on monetary financing. You see, there's a difference between money printing and credit creation. Credit creation happens when banks lend money. There's the moment banks make a loan, it becomes a deposit in somebody's bank account. And that's how money supply, which is an aggregate of all bank deposits and currency in circulation, goes up. The difference is that when you make a loan, there's a market-based interest rate attached to that. So the issue with Sri Lanka, and I'll come back to that, why these crises keep happening is we don't have a market economy in Sri Lanka. In a market economy, the essential things is that scarce resources should be reflected, the scarcity value should be reflected by prices. And the difference between different goods and services should be maintained by relative prices. So for example, the cost of money is the interest rate. The cost of your exchange rate is relative to another exchange rate. That's a relative price. All of these things should be market determined. So now what happened in Sri Lanka is that we, we run a state that is both derages, where the government is poking its fingers, where the market uh, should operate. The best example is trying to put flow prices on hotel rooms in the city of Colombo, which is a very, very silly idea. And the other thing is this penchant of otaki, what is called otaki, that we can be self-sufficient. We have tried this number of times and it has been diabolical failures. Now, why inflation happened in Sri Lanka was there are enormous amount of money printing and the scarcity value of imported commodities were not reflected by their scarcity value because you tried to fix the exchange rate. So you made imported goods artificially cheap. You did not price energy at what it should be with the necessary taxation. You sold electricity below its cost price for something like 10 years. These are very, very large parts. About 18 to 19 percent of your import bill is coming through energy, all forms of energy. So when you have these imbalances, that created too much money chasing too few goods. And unfortunately, I don't have my chart deck, but I can show you that in the years 2020, 2021, demand was off the chart. Even though we were having power cuts, if you look at electricity consumption, fuel crisis, it was way, way above even 2018, which was the most normal. So that is what caused inflation. Now, our assertion that there is a contraction in demand and there is too many more goods is correct. 
because basically people can't afford. But that is the rebalancing situation that that is within the grounds of people's affordability and some of it was due to supply chain shocks. Hmm. So take for example the exchange rate. When the official exchange rate was say 360 and 370 because there wasn't sufficient available in the market and they were using the informal channels, many people were pricing their products at 450 rupees as the exchange rate. All that got fed into prices. Now a lot of those prices are coming down because they realize that there is such a big demand contraction in anything that is semi-discretionary, it is coming down. So now comes the question of inflation because it's a comparison between 12 months before and 12 months today. There is no doubt that the price increase has come down and on a month on month basis also there is a slight reduction like half a percent or sometimes even zero or very very little. So since it is called the base effect because we are comparing with last year, there is no doubt that all indices are showing that the rate of increase has come down, right, there is no. Second thing is this argument about bashing the IMF, it is a very popular thing to bash the IMF. The IMF is only in Sri Lanka because we invited them and we have invited them for the 17th time and let us hope we do not invite them for the 18th time. Now they come because… Do you want to bet on that challenge? Yeah, you could, <laughs> no. I mean you could bet on that and uh, I, I have toasted that this would be the last IMF program but unfortunately it may not. Uh, because basically they come to us when we can't put our own house in order, you know. So repeatedly we have gone 17 times and Pakistan has gone 21 times and we have basket cases. Now the fundamental issue on Sri Lanka is we have imbalances. The biggest imbalance is coming from the FISC, which is the government. So government runs these large deficits and that is what the economy is called twin deficit countries that because the government has a dissaving revenue minus recurrent expenditure and has capital expenditure, the private sector's surplus is not enough to fund the government. This is the main reason that we run this current account deficits. It has very little to do with that we don't export enough. It is that we have too much of consumption, too much of investment. We have too much of consumption and investment because the government basically does not tax the people. So there is excess amount of aggregate demand in the economy. You have to correct that with proper pricing and you have to have fiscal policy that they correct enough taxes so that they don't run a negative savings and they run uh, somewhat of a lower uh, deficit on the, uh, on the overall deficit and we have to encourage that investment is made on a very highly productive basis. Now when you have large buildings, tall buildings coming up and you give concessions that you reduce the tax intensity and allow the rich people to enjoy luxurious apartments with huge tax holidays, tax concessions, you are misallocating resources, right. So you have to first of all put this system into balance. Now how, what would you do? How do you come out of this? The problem with Sri Lanka is the state is captured, right? Because look at our political system. We have an executive presidency and we have an electoral system that requires a lot of money to be in politics. You also have a civil service that is completely according to the constitution. The president appoints the secretaries and the, the secretaries will act under the direction and control of the ministers. So this country policy making is seldom in the interests of the 22 million people. It is invariably a small select of elite who basically have significant influence on economic policy and this is called economic extraction. So you know whether to protect industries, whether to allow imports, I mean always somebody is gaining from this, right? It's not the average household. The average household wants a very competitive system. So the, 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 the challenge is going to be that how do we find this balance that you know pe some people are going to have to lose out. I mean in the sense that those who have benefited massively by manipulating the system, th that has to go. So the only way that we can come forward is to really and I do agree with the president's ideology of a highly competitive social market economy because the key words is the market. In the market, the key underpinning factor is competition. Competition will drive productivity improvement, productivity improvement will drive innovation and growth. And the social part, the welfare part is in a market economy you will have winners and losers. 
the welfare part is that no one gets left behind. And ideologically, this is the best system for Sri Lanka. So I sincerely hope that I fully agree with the, uh, the president's economic ideology that this is the way to go. Uh, so, Mr. Jaffarji, on, on, on the requirement of the uh, domestic debt optimization, I think Pram said that you know if, if, if inflation is reducing, if interest rates are anyway reducing, if the central bank bonds are maturing in a year or so, why optimize on the debt? So, so it's like this, right? So, the central bank, what you want to do is what is maturing has to be refinanced. So, you have a huge rollover overhang. Now, when you exchange, uh, it won't roll over. It's not going to roll over every year, right? So you've got two and a half trillion of central bank bonds rolling over. That's 10 percent of GDP. Remember, we talked about the GFN hitting 37 percent, etc. 10 percent of that is from the central bank, right? Now, if you don't do this reprofiling, and they they said that nothing will mature for five years, and between year five and 15, it will start maturing in like equal installments, basically. You are giving space. Right? So we are like a very deeply sick patient. We need to re-energize. We need to heal. We need time. Right? Then when we get momentum, we can handle this because expectations change. We start fixing ourselves. So there was no other way to do this. This had to be done. And this is the right thing because the government owns the central bank. So all that interest that comes to the central bank, they don't use that. Basically, they deduct the expenditure, which is about 25 billion rupees. And if you have two and a half billion, two and a half trillion of bonds, and you are earning 10 percent interest, hypothetically, you are making 250 billion rupees profit, and you are using 25 billion. Mm -hmm. If you are earning 20 percent, you are making 500 billion rupees of interest income minus expenditure. It's all going back to the government. So by adjusting this, I mean you can do NPV, etc. They will recognize a huge loss. They will earn it back and slowly this will go back. So I don't have any problem with what happened to the central bank. It had to be done. As far as saying that we didn't have to do the other things that, you know, it's rupees. You know, <coughs> our alternative was very simple. Inflate the problem away. That was an option. And that's a terrible tax. And we are going into a new uh, central bank law that is going to hold the governor accountable to parliament for two successive quarters that if he doesn't come into the inflation target, he has to come and explain why I didn't receive it. So if you give the trade-off between a restructuring and high inflation, inflation hits the poor and inflation will kill growth because it takes the incentive for investment. I any day prefer profiling because it will then take away hopefully from the richer people and save the poor people and a low inflation environment is better for everybody. So, but with, uh, what, what? I think Shalin, no, couple of couple of comments. So, I mean, IMF is not the only solution. There are many other solutions. Uh, Mahathir managed the I mean, Malaysia crisis without IMF. He took a call, and there are some countries gone to IMF once, like India, early 19, 90s BOP crisis went to IMF once. That was it. Korea is another good example. We are in this state, or oh, in Argentina, because we do the mistakes again and again, and we never reform. So we gone to IMF 16 times. It's our mistake. Now this time also. The kind of reforms that we have come up with, I think, uh, done after careful consideration. Something, something that we've done long before, cost-reflective pricing, etc. Uh, I think, uh, I, I think we have to find our own solution. Forget IMF at this point, because we need IMF to give some amount of stability, give the confidence to investors, cross debt restructuring more than anything else, uh, because we are in default. We need to understand that this is not a normal situation. We have, I think, after a very long time, an Asian country has gone into default. Uh, so IMF is not the only solution, but I think we have to work with IMF at this point uh, with our own plan, and we have to commit to that plan. It's very important. The one other thing is, I agree with Murtaza, our issue is a larger fiscal issue. BOP is a separate issue. It's a larger fiscal issue. We've been living on the edge for 70 plus years. Now we are looking at a 3.6% fiscal deficit by 2027. Those are the aggressive targets that we have set. Just mind you, we only been like 4% once in a life in 1974. So 3.6 percent fiscal deficit by 2027 is very optimistic. We are looking at 3.2 uh, 2 trillion of tax revenue or total revenues for this year. That's the forecast. IMF said 3.4, we said 3.2. Now looks like we'll end up, end up at 2.6 trillion. Mm. Our interest cost will be 2.2 trillion this year if you go on like this without DDO. So just imagine, larger part of your revenues will go for interest. So interest cuts, reprofiling, debt relief, critical for us to breathe. And then stimulating the economy is critical because I think we are 
not not forecasting our growth properly. Uh, MF has you know put a three percent growth target. Uh, I think we can do much more than that. We can grow at four five percent. One last thing on the, on the revenue. We could go much higher than the IMF. Of course, yes. Target. Of course, yes. So we but, can grow at four percent. But Bigumal, now you, there are there are targets. There are these things that are written down on paper saying you must reach this, you must do this at this time. But is there any is there any plan? or any idea of how the government is, is trying to stimulate this, is trying to drive this? Are there any numbers on that? So we have to see in the, the, the next plan will come in the next budget, okay. but I'm sure they are working on multiple initiatives in terms of getting the growth up. Uh, growth had been a really bad story in the, in the first mm. quarter, it's down by 11 and a half. So I believe Sri Lanka should grow at actually not 4%, 6-7%. That should be our aspiration ideally. Uh, IMF has given us a 3% target. I think uh, they kept it low to you know simulate the numbers, but I think we can do much more than that. Uh, and one last thing, the tax collection. So tax tax is the main problem. That the way we collect taxes and who pays taxes and all that is about 120,000 employees paying over 100,000 employees paying taxes. Maybe another 200,000 more tax files uh, on the institutions, the corporates about 65,000 tax files. Uh, 30,000 plus paid uh, as filed the tax, only 15,000 you know, entities paid taxes. So there's a larger issue there. Now this had been like this from 1948, right? So it's not a new thing. We've been evading taxes, not paying taxes, but we, we, we drive big cars, we build big houses. Every one got a big building somewhere. You know, now most of the, oh, but the buildings But the situation are hasn't changed even though we are in a state of bankruptcy. <laughs> Nothing much has happened in terms of broadening. I agree with you. Exactly. Without digitizing the economy, without di getting a digital ID, without digitizing the companies, digitizing the VAT like India has done, we will not achieve those targets. We are, we are very, very, uh, we have been not optimistic about the revenue targets right now. Now you spoke of India and, and that's, that's uh, something, we, we had the Indian High Commissioner at an event uh, recently and he spoke very glowingly about the digitization of India and how the Indian government's this this particular system, uh, payment system, has driven it. Um, and it, you know, when we asked him, it was so simple to set up. But here in Sri Lanka, we are not doing that. We are not even thinking of uh, going digital. Uh, we we prefer our corrupt system of files moving around and you know, uh, and so on. So so we seem to be still stuck in chapter one or chapter two uh, of this story. To me, that has to happen. There's no doubt. First of all, for digitizing the government is one big agenda, but just get the digital ID first. Just 22 million people, we have millions of QR codes now, right? And collecting taxes is not a, not a difficult thing. You know exactly who's running cars, who has built the houses, who owns the land. So there's enough data available. And you know the amount of tax files we have, it's very clear. But, that, but just In fact, the, the just data sorry. is already with the government, <laughs> because you can't well, build a house tax, without... Just actually, another thing, yes. if having to pay within their capacity is another thing. But Bigumal, just if they just don't one. have money to pay the taxes, how are they going to pay the taxes? Just one thing on the side, Bigumal. Now there were there were taxes mandated, of course, as far as the payee tax is concerned. But then um, there are instances where those who are entrusted with the collection of the taxes and who are above uh, the tax limit and who should be caught in the tax net aren't really paying their taxes. Also, no, I've I've heard about these things. Those should get you know get sorted. No doubt about it. But everybody but should pay taxes. That, 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 that deals a serious blow, I mean, like, as a, as a person. Yeah, but large issue, like is, large issue is broadening. Let's not look at one or two entities and five individuals and see what no, ones who collect what that. Is, what is the problem with every citizen over 18 having a tax file? Of course. A digital yes. one. Yes. I mean, so many countries have done it in the world. No, no, no having the tax file is not enough. There yes, are multiple then, entities, including the SMEs. Got the tax and file. Transparency. Yeah, not having the tax and file, policies. but your turnover is different. I, I worked in the SME sector. They always produce two books, one an official book and an unofficial book. So we as bankers also we are responsible because we look at the unofficial book and say, okay, turnover is good. There's net worth. There's bottom line. Let's lend to this company, right? Mm -hmm. But the formal book is something different. So we have done this for years. It's enough. So it's high time that yes, right now maybe there's no cash flow to pay taxes, but fundamental thing, you go to any OECD country, there's a tax structure. 
of course you can bring low tax for exporters low tax for startups no tax for startups for five years no tax for you know women led business for five years you can look at all of those things that's possible but we all have to but that's what we don't seem to be doing at all we all have to join the part i have a slight difference of opinion you know the, the basic principle is that uh, taxes something you pay after you make a profit right so the problem that most businesses have in sri lanka is to first turn a profit and if you look at the intervening factors uh, that hold back businesses uh when the harvard kennedy team in 2016 to 2018 did the growth diagnostic framework to understand what is holding back investment into export oriented industries it was policy inconsistency land industrial water which were what are called the binding constraints which are holding back nobody ever said anything about taxes there's uncertainty about taxes and nobody said anything about that real rates of interest are too high in sri lanka but we we don't never look at evidence based we think the solutions are different now if you want to widen the tax net and a people like me who have to pay 36% i have a serious problem that you have something called the strategic development act the strategic development act they can issue 25 year tax holidays now in spite of the fact that we are in an imf program and we are in economic crisis there have been instances where we have still issued 25 year tax holidays in highly oligopolistic businesses how do you justify this and these are large businesses the port city commission act permits them to give 40 year tax holidays this was not sunsetted and then there are boi companies who have been given tax concessions 20 years ago there are no sunset clauses their tax concessions are forever right so you could have two businesses one business paying at 30% other business paying at 20% where is the competition so it's distorting <laughs> it's distorting as i said this whole economy is full of distortions that some people benefit and others are disadvantaged you got to put everybody on a level playing field that is a fundamental premise of my arguments this evening that there has to be some equity in all policy makers so that everybody has a fair go now coming back to this question about uh SMEs and you you mentioned about cars and buildings the problem with cars and buildings is that's the asset side now when you look at the liability side it's different if it was being funded with hard earned money etc it's fine but invariably you will find that there's a lot of borrowings going on there and these borrowings are not necessarily being channeled for highly productive assets they are being channeled towards lifestyle assets and then when they come into trouble they go and say no you have to give us relief we are in problems so i've been also on a bank board etc and i have seen instances i mean there are so j- just to there was a misunderstanding earlier about this crib right the crib is the credit information bureau it's a registry so if you take a loan if you have a credit card etc all your records on the crib right every month the banks load up your credit files So anybody else who wants to lend to you you can go and look at the crib to find out whether you are a good borrower or not because you don't that that's the way that you can do credit assessment so the crib has been a tremendous innovation in sri lanka and it is because of the crib that there has been credit extension from the formal system so the last recollection i have there are about 8 million credit records in sri lanka there are about 8 million borrowers out of that two thirds of the borrowers some years ago had less than 500000 borrowed i believe that this record was about 3 years ago by now that 500000 probably is about 800000 etc so you have a large number of small borrowers and then you have a highly skewed that you will have a large number of few borrowers etc relatively so the, the question is that all borrowers are not bad right some people are better managing their affairs than others so you have to be very very careful that when you say that smes are in trouble etc you can't generalize that some people have been more prudent some industries are different to others obviously if you have interest rates at 25% everybody is going to get hammered so you have to be very careful in this public pro- policy thing not to paint with a broad brush oh my god namurtha sir i think you have been sitting in a bank but not realistically looking at the real point 
uh, when you say people have obviously yes everybody who borrows goes into the crib but not paying going into the crib and being blacklisted is two different things so when it comes to borrowing what happens is people we we only ask the government we only ask the government whoever who has gone into mpl or non performing into the crib after 2021 look into their possibilities only so if you think so then it, who, who who is going to pay for the adjustment no so if the government can get haircuts so can these people who have been put into the situation by the government smb never asked to be so in this then situation you have absolutely to tell the depositors to take I, the I, I, it's depositors itself is us not a, i mean of course uh, the big blue chip companies but, of the government protecting but, their deposits are not in this country they are in offshore accounts Tanya, Mind you, uh, no, uh, this no. is never here. So these uh, people Jamaji. who are today in the crib is nothing to do with the bad, bad management, but of course the bad management of the government. So we only urge the government, please look into the possibilities, whoever who went into not paying their debts after 2021. So Tanya, and look into no, their no, these, assist. These um, SMV uh, folks who have been forced to uh, into into financial issues since 2021 who have been uh, their names are now in the crib they've been reported whatever blacklisted whatever uh, so no so how do they access funding once again uh, even if the interest it rates rate come down, down this is what we have been how? asking the government you all are saying the interest rates will become the governor and the government and the central bank and the finance ministry talks of this interest rate coming down who are they going to lend and who are, who can borrow when you are in a position not paying in the crib? So that's why we said, we urged, do not, uh, we are not being unfair as the SMV. Just look at people who went into MPL or non-performing or bad debts after 2021. No, Mr. Jaffer, so go um, into them and look at them and try and help them out come out of the yeah, situation. Can I just like, just like Tanya said, uh, after 2021, you need to take into account the fact that interest rates spiked. Um, if a person had taken a car on lease, those spiked. Um, housing oh, so rate. Car, lease is a fixed interest rate, so it won't have spiked. There no, were. it's not only, spiked only but if you don't have the money to pay. Obviously, you're in the bad debt. Well, well interest, interest rate spiked. Interest rate yeah, spiked. But if you took a lease, prior to that, it's not... It's not no, 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 but they, they do... There, really, were, there, were there are clause, no way. <laughs> Uh, but it's, a fixed, it's a fixed instrument. Sorry, let's, let's, let's focus on the interest rates. The interest rates spiked up. People couldn't pay their debts. And, and according to Tanya's argument, that's one of the main reasons why they're in the crib now. And like Tanya said, um, if they are to continue in their businesses or, or to continue to live or do something with their lives, they need to you know, borrow again. And with low interest rates, now they can't borrow again because they're in the crib. How, how can this situation again, be addressed? you're misunderstood. Crib means good and bad. All exactly. No, no, no. Crib of non-performing. No, you're not in blacklist. Every single credit record, no. anybody who borrows is on the crib. No, if you are non-pay, yeah, you're, you're, you go as a non-paying. Yeah, well, let's, let's, I mean, let me, let me, let me clear a few things. Okay. This, there's nothing called blacklisting of hmm. clients. Uh, certain banks, different banks have different credit policies. Okay. So before the pandemic, if you have gone one month past due even, certain banks will not touch you. So for that bank, maybe you're blacklisted. Right? Okay. Certain banks after two months, three months, when you see a bad loan, banks will say no. Certain banks, even after three months, six months, even after one year, they will come and take the entire toxic asset, turn it out, restructure and take you back, take you into the new the, the bank, bank A to bank B. So all these things are possible. Even now, I don't think banks can look at the crib and say, oh, you are in the crib and we can't restructure. Because we have only lent money. Money is out there anyway. So you have to now find a way to recover. <laughs> but what is important is to understand the cash flows. Whether the, like, the business is viable, do you have cash flows with the new proposal? Mm. If there is a cash flow, if, the, if there is a proposition, I'm sure bank will partner. But there are cases where businesses are completely gone beyond repair. There's no succession. There's no business model to begin with. Like the hotel story that I said, you built a hotel in a, you know, in a in a remote location where there's no tourists. So there are many cases like that. If you go through Facebook hotels, you'll see many of those now for functioning as bungalows and very cheap. Well, the hotel. government built an airport just like that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the reality reality is you have to let go of certain things if things are not working. 
and then work with what's working and maybe you can also expand. Some, some companies, some SMEs have expanded during this crisis. Mm. People who saved, people who had done their own basis, they have expanded, they've gone into other segments. Some, some entities have exited. We believe a lot of the entities have now come to a conclusion about what is possible and what is not possible. And some have sadly gone out of business, we're really concerned about it. But I'm sure if you talk to your bankers, they will look at those and restructure and at least salvage whatever you can. That, that would be my take. Well, Mr. Jafferji, now, um, when we usually look at support from the government, many people want monetary support, financial support, moratoriums <coughs> and whatnot. Um, on, on the restructuring of these SMEs and, and seeing what's possible, uh, what can be done, how can finances be better allocated, um, there seems to be a lack of expertise amongst those engaging in the industry as well in certain instances, which is why there has been mismanagement in the cash um, during this crisis period. Um, do you think that the government should maybe look at setting up um, a support structure, at least for SMEs or anyone in distress to really access that kind of expert um, well. So uh, there are two pieces that are missing in an institutional framework. Mm. One is a, a need of the hour that should have been put in a few years ago, mm. which is a comprehensive insolvency framework, mm. right? Because we're kidding ourselves if we, if we believe that many of these businesses can come back because they're insolvent, which means that their owners' equity has been wiped out. Now, we have a certain insolvency uh, provision in a company's law, right? But majority of these borrowers are not companies, right? They will be proprietorships, partnerships, hmm. individuals, etc. They have to go under a different bankruptcy law, which originates from the 1890s, if I'm not mistaken. And the banks have something called parate law, which gives them seniority, and they don't have to go through a court winding up process. So there are different kind of seniority of creditors, your gratuity, your taxman, your EPF. When you stuck the creditors, there's a different seniority profile. Mm. So what the need that they are here is to come up with a unified bankruptcy law that kind of respects the seniority of these different creditors, but comes up with a procedural law to resolve these issues, including specialized bankruptcy courts. So you will have to train a lot of bankruptcy professionals. There are information asymmetries, so you need information brokers. It's a whole infrastructure that we have to put in. To me, this is the need of the hour. How you are going to resolve this to save the companies you can save, and close down the companies you can't save, right? The other part is that there has to be an enterprise development agency of the government. Mm. Uh, because it is not finance that most of these SMEs need, but they need to implement good management practices. May it be HR, may it be in marketing, may it be in financial management, etc. So there is a great need now. For example, Singapore had one called the Enterprise Development Board of Singapore. And they called it Spring and there is another avatar now. So there is a great need for that kind of support to come. Mm. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Jafferji. We're in the final few minutes of the show. Um, we now move to the closing statements from our panelists. Let's start off with Tanya Besundara, President of the Sri Lanka Business United yeah, Forum. Um, thank you very much. Uh both of you and I appreciate uh, this talk being given to us. I would like to emphasize on three things. One is we have been urging the government, the government needs to have proper long-term policies and short-term policies to uh, you know, look at the immediate crisis. And transparency and linkingness and digitalization is a must. Till that happens, this country will never go forward. That is one thing. And looking at the SMVs, uh, I myself is a SMV entity. I have 600 employers working under me. I have already closed down three factories. Okay, so three of my factories have been shut down. This is nothing due to my mismanagement. I liquidated my savings, my deposits, 
to pay off all banks when the crisis occurred. So these are few entities who can do things like that. But 60% of them, they have not had that ability. So today, these SMVs are facing the issues created by a monster called the government. This monster is eating up the people of this country. So they need to look at aspects in a humanity performance as not in just facts and figures. It's very easy to put out facts and figures, but go out there and see the reality. That's why we urge the government. It's not, we do not want a lending hand. We are not asking for, you know, hands out. We have been uh, an entity that has supported the government's economical back strength, country's economical strength. And to date, it's not the big companies that will be paying the taxes. These companies have their monies most of the time on offshore accounts. It is the SMEs who will, end of the day, pay uh, direct or indirect taxes to uphold a country's economy. So don't to ever forget that. And the government needs to understand this and help us not, we are not asking huge unnecessary help. We are only asking look into the aspects of the debt taken from how to when. And if you restructure, we are not asking for haircuts. We only ask for restructuring the debt or into a freezing the death of tour at least for a period of two years where we could bounce back that's all we have asked the government because every uh, because our liabilities are not uh, in a such a higher scale our turnover is never sufficient to you know uh, uh, bring about uh, the equality of the liabilities to the turnover so if the government needs to understand this at this moment if you are not allowed to turn around this big, uh, this country will never have a footage to stand on. Thank you very much, Tanya Besundar, President of the Sri Lanka Business United Forum. We now go to the closing statement of Brahm Nicholas, economist. I have a two-part closing statement. Don't worry, I won't overstretch my time. <laughs> uh, but both have to do with looking a bit more at the global economy. The first part of that, I think I already mentioned quite a few aspects of it, is looking around in the world and seeing what the successful countries are doing. Not just those ha have actually managed to go from developing country status to advance, such as Taiwan, Korea, and uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, but also the already developed countries. We look at the US, for instance. Now, what are they doing? Are they saying, we're not going to support our companies, we're not going to interfere, we're going to let the free market work, and then everything will be fine? Far from it. Has, you know, have you seen the CHIPS Act? Have you seen how many billions are being forked out to support the semiconductor industry in the United States. Why? Why not just let the free market operate and companies are happy to do some banking services, you know, uh, some weapons manufacturing in the US is big, pharmaceutical. You know, why cling on to the semiconductor industry? Well, actually look at it closely. Everyone is now battling in this one industry. And so this whole theory of that, you know, let the free market operate, don't support, you produce what you're good at, I'll produce what I'm good at, we'll trade those different goods and then we'll all be the happiest that we can be. I mean, seriously, is that the world that we're living in today? And there people also just need to, you know, look at uh, the literature like Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who wrote a book on the entrepreneurial state a cold entrepreneurial state where she emphasizes or actually tries to debunk the myth and successfully does so that the advanced countries got to where they are without any state support for their companies and let me emphasize that state support does not mean that you run some site, some sort of soviet union style communist country and economy it means aggressive support for your companies and let them compete in the global market. 
and amongst themselves because that's that's what China also does. You know, it provides incentives in those areas that the state has determined are essential to be competitive in. And then it promotes various companies to compete with each other and outside of China. So I think that has to be there in the policy framework of Sri Lanka. Other thing, final thing, is while everyone is so occupied with domestic policy in Sri Lanka, what is being completely missed is this massive global recession that is headed in our direction. You know, even the IMF acknowledges this. And that's why I find it strange that it hasn't been accounted for in the projections that they have made. So, you know, this is the way it now goes. If the IMF doesn't mention it, the policymakers certainly aren't taking it up. So they also seem to be very optimistic in terms of the budget projections and how they are going to manage the whole situation. So what's going to happen now? You can to head into a global recession. You think you can control the budget? What happens every time a global recession comes along in every developing country? The budget deficit goes up because your tax income plummets as a government and you have to support your poor or basically let them starve. And we're already at such high poverty levels. And then in context of all of that, you're coming with this central bank act that seems to have been forgotten where you're going to prevent the central bank from actually purchasing government debt and controlling interest rates. So in the middle of a global recession, you're going to get a domestic recession. You're going to try and control the budget deficit. And meanwhile, interest rates are shooting up. I mean, come on, guys. How is this preparing for the future? And I think some serious thought needs to be given to the global economy in those two aspects. Thank you very much, Brahm Nicholas, economist. We now move our attention to Bingumal Erthantri, chairperson of the Sri Lanka Banks Association. Thanks, Alan. So I think first thing first, uh, we need to cross debt restructuring before end of this year, mm. ideally by September, October, and get a rating upgrade, external rating Local upgrade. and international? Or? I mean, external rating upgrade by okay. Fitch and Moody's and all of right. that. And then <coughs> open the bank lines, start opening LCs, activate the trade, you mm. know, get things going and grow. Uh, I think in the process, revenue collection is key. So broadening the taxes through digitization would be a key initiative for the government. If they don't do that, uh, they'll have serious challenges in terms of reaching the, you know, the private surplus plus, you know, the, the, the GFN targets in terms of uh, mainly the fiscal deficit by 2027 will be a huge challenge for them. In, again, during the process, there's another budget coming up. Uh, we have to be very clear about what we want to do as a country. What are the strategic pillars? I slightly agree with Brahm in terms of supporting some of the strategic pillars. Uh, some countries have done it very successfully. Sadly, we have overdone these things and we have completely misused the you know, government uh, resources. Uh, so once you understand the strategic pillars, then having a policy framework around it and the policy consistency is also key. So then constitutional laws around protecting uh, some of those investors, be it local, be it foreign, would be critical. Uh, if you take the examples of Korea or Vietnam or US, then book that you mentioned, they didn't support everyone. They supported few key industries, including Apple. Right. So there are, there are case studies like that. Governments have, in a very subtle way, there's a way of supporting. You award contracts, you, you do many things to support. Even in the Middle East, you've seen uh, airlines getting a lot of state sponsorship. But we've done, we've overdone this whole thing, and we mismanaged the whole thing. So we have to be very careful when I say this. Um, I, am, I am for reviving, I am for uh, you know, growing the selected sectors the strategic pillars and protecting those investors through constitutional reforms. Uh, and, and we all have to play a role. So we cannot say that one should do it, I will not do it. We all have to play a role. Uh, I, I think the time is now and the end is near. Thank you very much, Bingumal Chairperson of the Sri Lanka Banks Association. And finally, we move our attention to the closing statement of Murtaza Jafarji, Chairman, Advocata. The economic crisis was many decades in the making. Now that this has hit us, we have to see that in order to come out of this, it is the more richer, the wealthier, the higher income earning households that have to take the majority of the burden. Therefore, whether it be the tax system or whether it be debt restructuring, it, we must ensure that it is skewed towards those who can afford and not necessarily be skewed to people who can't afford. So for example, I don't see much merit in increasing the excise taxes on alcohol and cigarettes 
because those who consume that in our local economy are not necessarily the higher income households, but it's more the working class blue collar households who have to bear that burden. The next issue that we have to do is the only way we can come out of this crisis is through growth. And in order for us to grow, we have to rethink the nature of the state. Now, the political arrangement in Sri Lanka with a very highly powerful executive presidency and an electoral system that requires a lot of money to be in parliament, this is not optimal. We have to rethink the way our political system works and we have to significantly strengthen our civil service because we need a strong and capable state. The problem we have is that we have a large number of civil servants but the quality, although there are exceptions, is a lot to be desired. And it's not only the private sector who is losing skilled people, it is also the state sector who is losing skilled people to migration, etc. So there has to be a lot of focus on building state capacity because we need a strong state to redirect our economic policies. Our government must focus on governance, not on large government. Uh, good governance means withdrawing from the market. We have too much of derigism where the state is meddling in the market economy. Either they are trying to control prices, they are trying to control outcomes. You can allow the market mechanism to find the most optimal outcome. The next issue is we must abandon this utopian ideal of autarky, basically self-sufficiency. Because a country of 22 million people cannot try to produce everything it needs itself. It can produce certain things like energy, etc. But we should produce things the world wants from us and import what we need. And in order to do that, we have to open our economy to competition. So the only way that you are going to have dynamic businesses and businesses that innovate and grow is you have to create a highly competitive social market economy which the president has advocated. And I sincerely hope and wish him all the luck that he can implement this because that is the way this economy can come out of this crisis. And lastly, basically, I'd like to say to your audience, I mean, our biggest problem in this country is ignorance, economic ignorance. A uh, lot of people don't understand, basically. And that is why I'm part of Advocata, whose mandate is try to improve economic literacy in the country. And we are pivoting more into Sinhalese to explain a lot of these basic things so that you have a framework to think about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murtaza Jafarji, Chairman of Advocata. Thank you very much once again to all our panelists for joining us on Face the Nation tonight. Thank you very much to Nirej Shelia Thambi for asking the right question. Uh, Mr. Jafarji, you said that um, there's a lot of ignorance, but um, what's more dangerous than ignorance is misinformation. Am I correct? Yes. And, and the thing is that the, 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 the propensity to do misinformation is extremely the mischief makers. <laughs> uh, you've got a lot of misinformation is. Yeah, so there's a That's lot of mis question. mischief makers in our country misinforming. They may be having a political uh, motive behind it. And that is why that we need somewhat of an economically literate population who can understand. And you know, otherwise, for too long. You know, people have fallen uh, victim to the gallery. You know, our politicians have played to the gallery. Mm. And politics has determined that the best course of action is that you play to the gallery. I mean, we have to elevate ourselves to a high, higher plane. Uh, that, of course, I truly believe a politician should never interact with business entities. That is the worst thing. Uh, today what's happening in this country. I think um, all our viewers would have had many experiences and, and could relate to these instances for so much. Uh, thank you very much once again to all our panelists. Thank you very much, Niresh. Um, well, like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It's created by man-made actions and it can certainly be undone by man-made actions. So let's take the right actions now and fix our motherland. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. God bless.